Uh, so we finished the last castle, and we're still reading Kugel Saga. In the meantime, I think I... I think I'm gonna give reading Venus Underground by Jeff Vandermeer a shot. Um, if you're not familiar, Vandermeer is a modern fiction writer who is... <laughs> incredibly talented and writes in the sort of weird and surreal often sort of like eco-fiction too um if you've seen the movie annihilation he wrote the trilogy the area x trilogy that the movie's based on uh, he also wrote born which i can't recommend enough venus underground is i think one of his earlier works and it's a little shorter than the others uh, the story itself, Venus Underground, is followed by a novella and some shorts, but Venus Underground itself, I think, is about 180 pages. And we'll see how it goes. I'll get started in, like, a minute and a half, maybe. All right, we're listening to some uh, Takashi Kokubo. Give it a shot and see if it suits the mood of the tale. And if it doesn't feel appropriate, I'll screw around with something else. Okay, we're going to get started with Venus Underground. This is part one, chapter one. Part one is entitled Nicholas. Let me tell you why I wish to buy a meerkat at Quinn's Shanghai Circus. Let me tell you about the city. The city is sharp. The city is a cliché performed with cardboard and painted sparkly colors to disguise the empty center, the whole. That's mine. The words. I specialize in hollow arts, but every once in a chemical moon I'll do the slang jockey thing on paper. Let me tell you what the city means to me, so you'll understand about the meerkat, because it's important. Very important. Back a decade, when the social planners ruled, we called it Dayton Central. Then, when the central government choked flat and the police all went freelance, we started calling it Venus, like an adder's hiss, deadly and unpredictable. Art was dead here until Venus. Art before Venus was just whorehole stuff, street mimes with flexi faces and flat media. That's what the social revolutions meant to me. Not all the red rum riots and the twisted girders and the flourishing free trade markets and the hundred meter high ad signs sprouting on every street corner. Not the garbage zones, not the ocean junks, not the underlevel coups, nor even the smell of glandular drugs, musty yet sharp. No, Venus, bought <clears throat> Venus brought old art to an end, made me dream of success with my omnipresent omni-everything hollow vision. Almost brought me to an end as well one day, for in the absence of those policing elements of society, except for pay for hire, two malicious thieves, nay, call them what they were, pick dicks, well, these two pick dicks stole all my old style ceramics and new style hollow sculpture, and after mashing me on the head with a force that split my brains all over the floor, split too. Even my friend Shadrach Begolem showed concern when he found me. A brooding sort, my friend Begolem. No blinks, no twitches, no ticks. All economy of motion, of energy, of time. I.E. the opposite of me. But we managed to rouse an autodoc from its wetwork slumber and got me patched up. Boy, did that hurt. 
Afterward, I sat alone in my apartment studio, crying as I watched Nuevo Westerns on a hollow Shadrach lent me. All that work gone. The faces of the city, the scenes of the city that had torn their way from my mind to the hollow, forever lost, never even shown at a Galleria, and not likely to have been either. Venus, huh? The adder defanged, the snake slithering away. When did anyone care about the real artists until after they were dead? And I was as close to dead as any living artist ever was. I had no supplies. My money had all run out on me, plastic rats deserting a paper ship. I was as much a goner as the AIs they'd murdered to restore order, all those artistic dreams so many arthritic flickers in a hollow screen. You don't have a cup of water on you by any chance, or a pill or two. I think I always had artistic dreams. When we were little, my twinned sister Nicola and I made up these fabric creatures we called cold pricklies and, to balance the equation, some warm fuzzies. All through the sizzling summers of ozone rings and water conservation and baking metal, we'd be indoors with our make-believe world of sharp hard edges and diffuse soft curves, forslaking the thirst of veldt and jungle on the video monitors. We were both into the living art then, the art you can touch and squeeze and hold to your chest, not the dead flat screen scrawled stuff. Pseudo mom and pseudo dad thought us wonky, but that was okay because we'd always do our chores and because later we found out they weren't our real parents. Besides, we had true morals, true integrity. We knew who was evil and who was good. The warm fuzzies always won out in the end. Later, we moved on to genetic clay, child gods creating creatures that moved, breathed, asked for attention with their mewling, crying tongues. Creatures we could destroy if it suited our temperament. Not that any of them lived very long. My sister moved away from the living art when she got older, just as she moved away from me. She programs the free market now. So, since Shadrach certainly wouldn't move in to protect me and my art from the cold pricklies of destruction, I mean, I couldn't go it alone. I had this horrible vision of sacrificing my ceramics, throwing them at future picnics because the hollow stuff wouldn't do any harm of a physical nature. Which made me think, hey, maybe this hollow stuff is dead art too, if it doesn't impact the world when you throw it. Since that was dead idea, I was determined to go down to Quinn Shanghai Circus, whoever that was, and, quote, get me a meerkat, quote, as those hokey Nuevo Westerns say. A meerkat for me, I'd say. Tall as you please. Make it a double. In a dirty glass cage. Oh, I'd crack myself up if the picnics hadn't already. Tricky, tricky picnics. But you're probably asking how a living artist such as myself, a gaunt, relatively unknown, and alone artiste, could pull the strings and yank the chains that get you an audience with the mysterious Quinn. Well, I admit to connections. I admit to Shadrach. I admit to tracking Shadrach down in the Canal District. Canal District, Shadrach, they go together like Voloidia and Siren, like Ozzy and Elliot, Romeo and Juilliard. You could probably find Shadrach down there now, though I hardly see him anymore on account of my sister Nicola. That's how I met Shadrach, through Nicola, when they shared an apartment. You see, Shadrach lived below level for his first 25 years, and when he came up, the first place they took him to after orientation was the Canal District. A wall of light, he called it, and framed against this light my sister Nicola, who served as an orientation officer back then for peoples coming above ground. A wall of light and my sweet sister Nicola and Shadrach ate them both up. Imagine, living in a world of darkness and neon for all of your life and coming to the surface and there she is, an angel dressed in white to guide you, to comfort you. If you had time, I'd tell you about them because it was a thing to covet their love, a thing of beauty to mock the cosmetics ads and the lingerie hollows. Anyway, Ever since the space freighters stopped their old splash and crash in the cool-down canals, the canal district has been the hippest place in town. Go there sometime and think of me, because I don't think I'll be going there again. Half the shops float on the water, so when the ocean-going ships come in with their catch and offload after decon, the eateries get the first pick. All the biggest wigs eat there. You can order pseudo-whale, fiddler, sunfish, the works... Most places overlook the water, and you can find anything there, mechanicals and living art and sensual pleasures that'll leave you quivering and unconscious, all done up in a palette of colored sure to please. 
Sunsets courtesy of hollow ink, so you don't have to see the glow of pollution, the haze of smog, shit, muck. Whenever I was down there, I would go just to sit and watch the giants of bio-industry and the arts walk by, sipping from their carafes of algae, which I don't envy them, rock-gut seaweed never having been a favorite of mine. And so I was down, real down, more down than now, sitting in a garbage zone and spieling to you, and I wanted to talk with Shadrach because I knew he worked for Quinn, and he might relent, relinquish, and tell me what I wanted to know. It so happened that I bumped into Shadrach in a quiet corner, away from the carousing and watchful eye of the canal police, who are experts at keeping order, but can never decide exactly which order, if you know what I mean, and you probably don't. We still weren't alone, though parts merchants and debauched jewelry concierge wives and stodgy auto dogs, gleaming with a hint of self-repair, all sped or sauntered by, each self-absorbed and self-absorbing. Shadrach played a cool, cooler, coolest, listening to the sea beyond, visible from a crack in our tall, failing walls. Hi, I said. Haven't seen you since those lousy picnics did their evil work. You saved my skin, you did. Hello, Nick, Shadrach replied, looking out at the canals. Hello, Nick, he says, after all the compli and condiments I'd given him. Shadrach is a tall, muscular man with a tan, a flattened nose from his days as courier between city-states. The funny people gave him that, and a dour mouth. His clothes are all out of date, his boots positively reeking of antiquity. Still thinks he's a 27th century man, if you know what I mean, and again, you probably don't. After all, you are sitting here, in a garbage zone, with me. So... How were things with you? I said, anticipating that I'd have to drag him kicking and screaming to my point. Fine, he said. You look bad, though. No smile. I suppose I did look bad. I suppose I must have, still bandaged up and a swell on my head that a geosurfer would want to ride. Thanks, I said, wondering why all my words, once smartly deployed for battle, had left me. No problem, he said. I could tell Shadrach wasn't in a talking mood, more like a dead art mood as he watched the canals. And then, the miracle. He roused himself from his canal contemplation long enough to say, I could get you protection, all the while staring at me like I was a dead man, which is the selfsame stare he always has. But here was my chance. Like what, you shiller? I said, a whole friggin' police unit all decked out in alky and shiny new bribes. He shrugged and said, I'm trying to help. Small fish need a hook to catch bigger fish. Not a bad turn of phrase, I said, lying. You get that from looking into the water all damn day. What I need is Quinn. Shadrach snorted, said, You are desperate. An invite to Quinn. He wouldn't meet my gaze directly, but edged around it, edged in between it. Maybe in a million years you'd build up the contacts, he said, the raw money and influence. I turned away because that stung. The robbery stung. The not being able to sell the art stung. Life stung and stunk. Easy for you, Shadrach, I said. You're not a living artist. I don't need an invite. Just give me the address and I'll go myself to beg a meerkat. Anything extra I do on my own. Shadrach frowned, said... You do not know what you are asking for, Nicholas. I thought I saw fear in him. Fear and an uncharacteristic glimpse of compassion. You will get hurt. I know you and I know Quinn. Quinn isn't in it for the living art. He's in it for other reasons entirely. Things I don't even know about. By now, I'd begun to break out in the sweats and a moist heat was creeping up my throat. And hey, maybe I'd had too much on the drug side on the way down, so I put a hand on his arm, as much to keep my balance as anything. For a friend, I said. For Nicola. I need a break or I'm going to have to go below level and live out my days in a garbage zone. And look where I am today, in a garbage zone, talking to you. Bringing up my sister was low, especially because I owed her so much money, but bringing up a low level was lower still. Shadrach still had nightmares about living underground with the muties and the funny people and the drip, drip, drip of water constantly invading the system. He stared at me, the knuckles of his hands losing color where they clutched the rail. Did he, I hoped, see enough of my sister in me? 
But I'm not heartless. When I saw him like that, the hurt showing, as surely as if they'd broken up a day ago, I recanted. I said, forget it, my friend, forget it. I'll work something else out. You know me, it's okie dokie. Shadrach held me a moment longer with his gray, unyielding eyes. Then he sighed and exhaled so that his, sh <clears throat> and exhaled so that his shoulders sagged and his head bowed. He examined his stick-on sandals with the seriousness of a podiatect. You want Quinn, he said. You first have to promise me this is a secret. For life, God help you. If it gets out Quinn seeing someone like you, there will be a whole bunch of loonies digging up the city to find him. Someone like you hurt. But I just said, who am I going to tell? Me, who's always borrowing for the next hollow. People avoid me. I'm alone in this world. Quinn could get me close to people. I know, he said, a bit sadly, I thought. So tell me, I said, where is it? You have to tell Quinn I sent you, he said, and pointed a finger at me. And all you want is to buy a meerkat. You that budsky budsky with Quinn? I said, incredulous and a little loud, so a brace of canal policemen gave me a look like I was a lunio. Keep your voice down, Shadrach said. Then go west down the canal side escalators until you see the Mercado streetlight. There's an alley just before that. Go down the alley. At the end, it looks like a dead ender because there are recycling bins and other debris from the last ten centuries. But don't be fooled. Just close your eyes. It's a hollow. And when you're through, there's Quinn's right in front of you. Just walk in. Thank you, Shadrach, I said, heart beating triple time fast. I'll tell Nicola that you gave her the time of day. His eyes widened and brightened, and a smile crossed his face, fading quickly. But I knew, and he knew I knew. Be careful, he said, his voice so odd that shivers spiraled up my back. He shook my hand. Quinn's a little strange, he said. When it's over, come and see me. And remember, Nicholas, don't. Don't dicker with him over the price to be paid. Then he was gone, taking long, ground-eating strides away from me down the docks, without even a goodbye or a chance to thank him, as if I was somehow tainted, somehow no good. It made me sad. It made me sad and it made me mad, because I've always said Shadrach was off, even when Nicola dated him. Shadrach and Nicola... I've had relationships, but never the big one. Those loving young lovers strolling down by the drug-free zones. Those couples coupling in the shadows of the canals. They don't know what it is to be desperately in love. And perhaps even Nicola didn't know. But I thought Shadrach would die when she left him. I thought he would curl up and die. He should have died, except that he found Quinn, and somehow Quinn raised him up from the dead. Chapter 2, but I'm going to take a short break first to enjoy a libation. All right, <clears throat> chapter two. What does Quinn do, you ask? As if you have the right to ask questions knee-deep in garbage. But you've asked, so I'll tell you. Quinn makes critters. He makes critters that once existed, but don't now. Tigers, sheep, bats, elephants, dolphins, albatrosses, seagulls, armadillos, dusky seaside sparrows. Or critters that never existed except in myth flat media or hollows. Jabberwocks, Grinches, Ganeshas, Puppeteers, Gobble Snorts, Snarks, or critters that just never existed at all until Quinn created them. Beetle worms, eel goats, camel apes. But the best thing he does, the liveliest art of all, for my purposes, is to improve on existing critters, like meerkats with opposable thumbs. His meerkats are like the old, old Stradivarius violins, each perfect and each perfectly different. Only the rich could procure them through influence mostly, not money. Because, <laughs> pardon, because Quinn didn't work for money, it was said, but for favors. I'm going to skip this track. <laughs> 
Though no one could guess what favors and at what cost, rumor had it Quinn had started out assisting state-sponsored artificial pregnancies before the fall of government, but no one knew anything concrete about Quinn's past. So I daydreamed about meerkats after Shadrach left me. I imagined wonderful, four-foot-tall meerkats with shiny button eyes and carrot noses and cool bipedal movement and can-I-help-you smiles. Meerkats that could do kitchen work or mow the atrophy... <laughs> the, at, the, <laughs> this is impossible for me to pronounce or say properly. I don't know why. Atrophoturf. There we go. Meerkats that could do kitchen work or mow the atrophoturf in your favorite downtown garden plot even wash clothes, or, most importantly, cold cock a pick dick and bite a silly wiener off. This is the principal image of revenge I had branded into my mind, quite as violently as those awful Nueva Westerns, which, as you have no doubt already guessed, are my one weakness. Ah, yes siree, Bob, gonna rope me a meerkat, right after I defend my lady's honor and wrestle with this here polar bear. I mean, come on, no wonder it was so hard to sell my hollow art before the pick dick stole it. But, as I headed down the alley, which looked quite dead-endish later that night, having just had a bout of almost fisticuffs, more cuffs than fisties, with a Canal District barkeep, I admit to nervousness. I admit to sweat and trembling palms. The night was darker than dark. Wait, listen. The end of the world is night. That's mine, a single-cell haiku, and the sounds from the distant bright streets only faintly echoed down the loom and doom buildings. Stink of garbage, too, much like this place. As I stepped through the holograph, a perfect rendition that spooked me good, and came under the watchful eyes in the purple-lit sign, Quinn's Shanghai Circus, I did the thrill in the spine bit. It reminded me of when I was a kid, again, and I saw an honest-to-greatness circus with a real sparrow doing tricks on a high wire, even a regular dog all done up in bows. I, remembering, uh, I remember embarrassing my dad by pointing when the dog shat on the circus ring floor and saying, Look, Dad! Look! Something's coming out of the back end! Like a prize, maybe? I didn't know better. Hell, I didn't even know my own dad wasn't real. Even then, the genetic toys I played with, Ruff the Rooster with the cold eyes I thought stared maliciously at me during the night, Goof the Gopher, who told the dumbest stories about his good friends the Echinoderms, all produced waste in a nice solid block through the navel. But I have let my story run away without me, as Shadrach might say, but has never said, and into nostalgia, and we wouldn't want that. So, as soon as I stepped into the blue velvet darkness, the doors sliding shut with a hiss behind me, the prickly feeling in my spine intensified, and all the sounds from the alley, all the garbage odors and tastes, were replaced with the hum of conditioners, the stench of sterility. This was high class. This was atmosphere. This was exactly what I expected from Quinn. To both sides, glass cages embedded in the walls glowed with an emerald light, illuminating a bizarre bunch of critters. Things with no eyes, things with too many eyes, things with too many limbs, things with too many teeth, things with too many things. Now I could detect an odor, only partially masked by the cleanliness, the odor of the circus I had seen as a kid. The bitter-dry combination of urine and hay, the musky smell of animal sweat, of animal presence. The cages, the smell, made me none too curious, made me look straight ahead, down to the room's end, some thirty yards away, where Quinn waited for me. It had to be Quinn. If it wasn't Quinn, Quinn couldn't be. He sat behind a counter display. A rectangular, desk-like contraption within which were embedded two glass cases, the contents of which I could not ID. Quinn's head was half in dark, half in the glow of an overhead light, but the surrounding gloom was so great that I had no choice but to move forward, if only to glimpse Quinn in the flesh, in his seat of power. When I was close enough to spit in Quinn's face, I gulped like an oxygen-choked fishy, because I realized then that only did Quinn... <clears throat> Pardon, because I realized then that not only did Quinn lean over the counter, he was the counter. I stopped and stared, mine eyes as buggy as that self-same fishy. I'd heard of Don Daly's self-portrait, mixed media on pavement, which consisted of darling Don's splatted remains, but Quinn had taken an entirely different slant that reeked of genius. It also reeked of squirrels in the brain, but so what? Portrait of the artist as a slab of flesh. 
The counter itself had a yellowish tan hue to it, like a skin transplant before it heals, and it was dotted with eyes, eyes that blinked and eyes that did not, eyes that winked, all watching me, watching them. Every now and again, I swear on my slang jockey grave, the counter undulated as if breathing. The counter stood some three meters high and twenty long, five wide. In the center, the flesh parted to include the two glass cages. Within the cages sat twin orangutans, tiny but perfectly formed, grooming themselves atop bonsai trees. Each had a woman's face with drawn cheekbones and eyes that dripped despair and hopelessness. Atop the counter, like a tree trunk rising out of the ground, Quinn's torso rose, followed by the neck and the narrow, somehow serpentine head. Quinn's face looked almost oriental, the cheekbones pinched and sharp, the mouth slight, the eyes lidless. The animal musk, the bitter sweetness came from Quinn, for I could smell it on him, pungent and fresh. Was he rotting? Did the Prince of Genetic Recreation rot? The eyes, a deep blue, without hope of reflection, stared down at the hands. Filaments running from each of the twelve fingers dangled spiders out onto the counter. The spiders sparkled like purple jewels in the dim light. Quinn made them do undulating dances on the countertop, which was his lap. Twelve spiders in a row doing an antique cabaret review. Another display of living art. I actually clapped at that one, despite the gob of fear deep in my stomach. The fear had driven the slang right out of me, given me the normals, so to speak, so I felt as if my tongue had been ripped from me. With the sound of the clap, a naked sound in that place, his head snapped toward me, and a smile broke his face in two. A flick of his wrist, and the spiders wound themselves around his arm. He brought his hands together as if in prayer. "'Hello, sir,' he said in a sing-song voice, oddly frozen." I came for a meerkat, I said, my own voice an, octa an octave higher than normal. Shadrach sent me. You came alone? Quinn asked, his blue eyes boring into me. Yes, I said, and with the utterance of that word, that single, tiny word with entire worlds of agreement coiled within it, I heard the glass cages open behind me, heard the tread of many feet, felt the presence of a hundred hundred creatures at my back, smelled the piss-hay smell clotted in my nostrils, making me cough. What could I do but plunge ahead? I came for a meerkat, I said. I came to work for you. I'm a hollow artist. I know Shadrach. The eyes stared lazily, glassily, and I heard the chorus from behind, from behind me in deep and high voices, in voices like reeds and voices like knives. You came alone? And I was thinking then, dear Yahweh, dear Allah, dear God, and I was remembering the warm fuzzies and the cold pricklies of my youth, and I was thinking that I had fallen in with the cold pricklies and I could not play omnipotent now, not with the liveliest of the living arts. And because I was desperate, and because I was foolish, and most of all because I was a mediocre artist of the hollow, I said again, I want to work with you. In front of me, Quinn had gone dead, like a puppet, as much as the spiders on his fingers had been puppets. Behind me, the creature stepped forward on cloven hooves, spiked feet, sharp claws, the smell overpowering. I shut my eyes against the feel of their paws, their hands, clammy and soft, cruel and hot, as they held me down, as the needles entered my arms, my legs, and filled me with the little death of sleep. I remember seeing the orangutans weeping on their bonsai branches and wondering why they wept for me. Let me tell you about the city, sir. Like an adder's kiss, sharp and deadly. It's important. Very important. Let me tell you about Quinn and his meerkats. I work for Quinn now, and that's bad business. I've done terrible. I've done terrible things. The deadest and deadliest of the dead arts. The cold pricklies of the soul. I've killed the living art. I've killed the living. And I know. I know it. Only, only the flesh comes off me, and the flesh goes on like a new suit. Only the needle goes in, and the needle comes out, and I don't care, though I try with all my strength to think of Shadrach and Nicola. But the needle goes in, and let me tell you about the city. That's the end of part one, Nicholas. Next is part two, Nicola. I think I'll start part two, Nicola, 
either tomorrow or Thursday. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's the first part of Venus Underground. Uh, I realize there's no way for me to... There's no way for people to tell me if they like it or not, I'm currently realizing on Twitch. Uh, so, you know, maybe I'll put my email in my bio or something, and uh, I, don't fuck, I don't fucking know. Maybe you can leave feedback. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we'll get down to the beginning of part two soon, and thanks for joining me.